and welcome to Ipsy Dixit. My name is Ben Edwards. I'm an associate professor of law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, William S. Boyd School of Law. And I'm here today uh, with Thomas Haley, who is a visiting assistant professor at the University of Utah, uh, and is in two weeks is joining uh, the University of Virginia as a research assistant professor. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. So, so the the article uh, we're talking about today is is data protection in disarray, and it's it's forthcoming at uh, was it Washington? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's it's a you know, excellent piece, uh, and, and talks a lot about uh, data privacy and all the the different ways uh, courts are getting it wrong. Uh, so, so what I, what I thought would be an easy way to to sort of get into this is. This is what's happening at Six Flags now. Like, if I if I want to buy a season pass at Six Flags, what kind of data do I have to surrender? So it turns out that if you want to pay whatever astronomical fee it costs to go to Six Flags, I guess in the in the before times, obviously no one's going now. Uh, you had to give up your fingerprints, and you had to check in with your fingerprints every time you came to the park, which was not the case when I was a Six Flags goer, but at some point uh, in, in the recent past, that's what they've started to do. Right, was, is there, a, this, this strikes me as just so strange. Why do they need your fingerprints? As far as I can tell, the only sort of rationale I can concoct for it is, uh, you know, what I think of as the wily teenager prevention. So like if my parents buy me a, a season pass and then one day my buddy wants to go and I can't go, I just give him my season pass. Well, that's that's a lost sale to Six Flags. Uh, but if I've got to check in with those same fingerprints, I mean, no way I can, I can share that pass anymore. Beyond that, uh, I can't think of any way that this is advantageous really to anyone, certainly not to the, the pass holder. Yeah, so so it it seems like it's this very casual view about collecting uh, you know, personal private information you know, by these businesses, and it, it seems to, from from the piece it seems like the courts share a lot of this view. You you, you talk a little bit about how judges may be different uh, than other people and how they view these things. How, what what way? How are judges exposed and, and and lose? How do they lose their privacy in ways that that we might not otherwise expect? Sure. So especially for federal judges, I mean, we've all seen some of the contentious confirmation proceedings that can go on, certainly at the Supreme Court level. But at any any level of, of Article Three judge, you've got to go through that vetting process. Um, probably not something that you're terribly excited to do if you're not sort of an extroverted person who, who maybe cares a little bit less about privacy. And uh, Leo Strahilovitz has written about this subject, that people who care less about privacy, uh, extroverts, tend to play a more outsized role in public life. Um, so, you know, I, obviously I can't go out there and, and make every federal judge take a personality test, but I think it it stands to reason that at least for some of these judges, that may be the case that we're, we're looking at people who uh, aren't, aren't as concerned about privacy, have less privacy in, in some respects than, you know, they would have had if they had just stayed at a law firm or whatever it was that they were doing before. And so, um, just because you know they are human, even though they're judges, uh, because they care less about privacy or experience less privacy, they see it as as less important or valuable than it might be to someone else. Now, this 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 makes sense to me in some in like in, in a very intuitive way that if if they cared enormously about privacy, they just simply wouldn't be a federal judge uh, because you you couldn't if you 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 if you were looking to maximize your privacy, you would never do that job. Uh, so, so when we're thinking about the, the, the leakage of private information, what, what struck me about the piece is, is you highlight how it's not just you know, a single data breach that's out there, but, but when information is, is leaked again and again and again, when that information starts to come together, it, it, it reveals an astonishing amount about people. Uh, how, how, does, how does aggregation you work if you if, if some some information is out there how, do, how does it end up getting combined with other pieces of information so it's it's becoming increasingly easy as you know computers get better and cheaper and more available uh, and people get better at doing this kind of work to take some information that you've you've gotten about a person from you know data breach a let's call it and and match it up with some different information you've got about that same person from data breach b so you might for instance 
uh, some of the case law involves um, payment card data from supermarket chains being stolen. So, okay, now I've got a payment card number and uh, a zip code that they had to punch in. Okay, I've got that. Um, maybe now I've, I've somewhere else got that same payment card number and a name that goes with that. Well, I can put those two together now. It's, you know, with the aid of technology now trivially easy. Now I've got the name, the, zip, the payment card, the zip, and maybe the name also from a third breach has given me the address and the social security number. So each of these pieces comes together and, and the more pieces are put together, the more risk there is that someone could use that information to do some harm to you, whether that be, uh, I think identity theft is the, the one that people are most obviously concerned about, but the range of things that, that people have done with other people's private info is pretty shocking. No, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's one of these, uh, your pieces you, you put together here, uh, you shock me. It, it was something like, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you just take birth date, you know, month, day, year, you know, zip code and gender, then it, you can essentially narrow it down to who it is with, you know, 86, 87% of the time, some, some astoundingly high number. Yeah, I think probably unless you live in in a very densely populated zip code, it's a pretty good likelihood that you're the only person in that zip code with that birthday and um, and that gender. And as as you get uh, an extra piece of information, even if the the data is otherwise anonymous, you can identify who it is with greater and greater certainty. Exactly. Yeah. So so you you talked about you know, there there's this, there's this thing of the non belief in the law of large numbers. What, what, what are we what are we looking at there? So this is a, an interesting sort of cognitive bias that that may come into play here. That's been studied by um, I, I talk about a paper by Ignacio Cofon and Adriana Robertson, who can take this 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 well known cognitive bias, which basically describes the fact that uh, any given person is likely to underestimate how informative any given piece of information they give up is to someone else. So. You know, when you when you see just your zip code flying out the door, you you will just naturally not understand how risky that can be. And that just, you know, with each piece of information that that doesn't really cause any further alarm. It's just we aren't equipped to to sort of deal with this problem. Yeah. So so each each individual piece of information may seem like it's not very much, but when it's added together with all these other pieces, it gets just terrifying. Exactly. And it's just sort of we have a sort of cognitive inability to to properly grapple with that, which can both so that their work focused on how that could explain what's known as the privacy paradox, which is this sort of not accurate belief that people say they care about privacy but act like they don't. One reason could be that they just don't realize how how dangerous it is. But in my view, it could also help explain why we have judges who are who are acting so you know, hostile to these kinds of claims, they too just don't get it. When they see, when they see a claim that X, Y, and Z bits of information were lost, well, that doesn't seem that bad. Uh, so, so where's the harm? So, so we're on the on the harm point, it, this this seems to be something that the courts really struggle with. You know, particularly where someone's identity hasn't already been stolen. But if we if we look at this from an expected harm you know, view, you know, each each data breach does an enormous amount of damage. It sure does. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because in some contexts, it seems like courts will take something like expected value into account. And yet, if they were going to do that, if, if they think they're doing that uh, in the data protection arena, it sure doesn't seem like it. So if you think about potential, you know, harm from just garden variety identity theft. So you've got to you've got to change your card numbers. You've got to pay for credit monitoring and all sorts of things. We're, we're looking at you know probably like the low four figures just to deal with that identity theft. Well, if the chance of that happening to you is only 1%, that's still an expected value that is higher than what courts have expressly said is enough to constitute harm, at least as far as standing is concerned, which is what my focus is in the paper. And yet uh, that that kind of analysis just doesn't seem to be happening in these cases. Huh. So so courts, courts are, it, seem, it seems, seems like they're just all over the map on, on how they're they're dealing with this. So let's talk a little bit about the method you use to to put this paper together because you know I was I was struck by just how how incredibly thorough it was. So how how many cases did you end up looking at? Um, let me let me double check the exact number, but it's a high number. 
it is again in the low four figures. Uh, so basically what I did was taking as a starting point the day on which the Supreme Court decided Clapper versus Amnesty International, which is sort of a, a leading case on imminent harm and standing. Uh, and that's, that's in February of 2013. So from then through the end of 2019, which is when I was putting the finishing touches on this, I you know ran a couple of Westlaw searches uh, and then read every case that came back, which was 2056, I now see. Yeah. It's a lot. And most, most of them were false positives, thankfully. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it's, that's a lot of cases. So, so you, you still narrowed it down to, to a pretty you know, significant number of cases. Yeah. So, so it ended up being for the criteria I was looking for, which is, was basically cl- cases involving a standing challenge where the claim alleges the wrongful collection or disclosure of private information. I found 217 cases in that time period in the federal courts. Uh, that were that that fit you know all of that criteria, and then of those, since I was looking at standing, I had to drop eight where the courts reach kind of a mixed result where they would say you know standing on this claim but not this one, or you know this plaintiff has standing but not this one. So you know, those those don't fit neatly into the analysis, so I had to exclude eight, ending up with two hundred nine cases that I went into some, some in depth analysis of. It's I mean, it's just phenomenal, like the the depth. Of analysis, and it's, you, it's, it seems like you, you were able to identify some things that we, we you wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, like uh, like the Southern District of New York uh, tends, you know, the, the judges there tend to get the issue better, and or at least in my view, uh, and and are less likely to deny uh, or to, to kick cases out on standing. But you know, other places, for example, uh, like Illinois, uh, you know, standing, you know, it's it's really hard to get inside the courthouse. Right. So I mean, when you say all over the map, that is uh, literally true. So the not surprisingly, because this is you know data focused paper, most of the cases come in the Northern District of California. That's where San Francisco, the Bay Area. So most of those companies are there. So it's common to see lawsuits there. But you know, you you would hope, or, or well, maybe you would hope, depending on how optimistic you are, that on a on a just an inquiry like standing. There wouldn't be that much variation across jurisdictions, and yet we see, as you say, you know, the Northern District of Illinois uh, threw out th- uh, two thirds of the the cases that came before it in in my data set, whereas Northern District of California was was pretty plaintiff friendly. They had uh, almost seventy percent of the cases they allowed to go forward. So, so when you when you were you digging down and looking at this, what's what's happening in Illinois? Like, why why is it coming out that way? So there's a couple of of different factors that I that I found that might bear on it. So one is uh, reliance on the Clapper decision. So Clapper is not a, a data protection or privacy case. It's it's a case about government surveillance and Amnesty International and similar organizations saying you know the government is eavesdropping on us as we're trying to work with people abroad for legitimate reasons, and that violates our constitutional rights. And the government comes back with this national security argument. So. The court relying on that says, you know, we're taking a very hard look at standing in this case because it's national security and it's separation of powers. But that case then gets sort of brought into the the data protection cases wholesale without really thinking about the heightened, you know, scrutiny that the court is giving. And in the Northern District of Illinois, I found uh, eleven out of the eighteen cases that I studied, the court relies on the Clapper decision. Whereas if you look to California, only 12 out of 37 actually look at Clapper. So, you know, whether, you know, there's a chicken and egg problem here, but um, that that at least is an interesting thing that's happening. There's also uh, an interesting line of cases in the Northern District of Illinois that involve the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act or BIPA, as it's sometimes called, where it's a sort of a procedural nightmare where you have, so BIPA is a very strong law, only one of its kind in the US, at least for now. Uh, and this is how Six Flags got into trouble uh, for their fingerprinting. But there's a line of cases in the Northern District of Illinois where plaintiffs file in state court and then defendants try to remove, because uh, they're class actions, they try to remove to federal court and then argue that the plaintiff has they, they argue for a merits dismissal because the plaintiffs are not aggrieved by the violation of BIPA. But the problem that occurs there is that aggrieved by the violation sounds a lot like uh, has no harm, which is part of the Article Three standing inquiry. And so the courts sometimes expressly force the parties to brief standing. 
So now you have a defendant who wants to remove to federal court who therefore has to argue the plaintiff has suffered a harm for Article 3, but also for the merits, they are not aggrieved by that harm. And then the plaintiff, if they want to avoid going to federal court, has to argue to the federal judge, we haven't been harmed for Article 3 purposes, but we have been aggrieved by the violation of a statute. So nobody has an incentive to make an argument. They're, they're basically kneecapping their own cases to, to make this standing argument. So the court probably is not getting the, the finest quality of argument on this. And sometimes, uh, for instance, at least in one case, the plaintiff just refuses to take a position on standing. They're, you know, they sued in state court anyway. Actually, I'm sorry, that case, they sued in federal court, and then they went back to state court later, and then the defendant tried to remove it. it that, that one was a whole mess. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you could see the depth you went into. So, so it, it's, it sounds like the adversarial system just isn't working very well uh, around you know, these particular precedents. Yeah, in the, in this particular situation, it is it is a mess, and that is particularly troubling. I think because uh, I argue in the paper that the whole point of standing doctrine in these kinds of private uh, disputes is just to preserve adversarial presentation of the issues because that's what our system relies on. Yeah. So, so on that, you know, the standing doctrine. You know, it, it's it's sort of loosely tethered to constitutional text, uh, but what what are the what are the, why do we have it? Like, what are the reasons why? So, it you say loosely tethered, and I think that's giving it too much. Uh, <laughs> anchoring. Literally, it is just that in in Article Three, Section Two, when when the Constitution lists what we call the the nine heads of jurisdiction, it uses this language of cases and controversies, and so standing doctrine has emerged from those two words, which are of course undefined. And basically says there is no – the judicial power of the United States doesn't exist if there is not a case or a controversy. Well, how do we find out if there's a case or a controversy? It took a few hundred years to get where we are now, but the Supreme Court has a three-part test for what standing is. The point of it, there are probably two leading sort of justifications for why we have this doctrine. So one, which is the one that the court relies on in Clapper, is the separation of powers. So the idea is that – if there's not an actual dispute, there's no case or controversy, then it starts to look like something that is better addressed to the political branches of government. This is stepping beyond the judiciary's role. So that, that has obvious application in a case that involves national security. Uh, it has obvious application in a case that I, I talk about in a little bit of depth in the paper from back when the 19th Amendment was being enacted and some you know grumpy businessman from New York wanted to put a stop to all of that. Uh, by getting the court involved in whether or not the 19th Amendment had been duly enacted. Um, but the other justification, which I think is more persuasive in the kinds of cases I'm concerned with here, is is that notion of we have an adversary system, our courts rely on it. So we don't want the courts to be making, you know, binding precedential decisions if they're not getting, you know, the best you know, fact development and getting all of the relevant legal authority put in front of them and having those those issues, you know, argued before them in such a way as to precisely frame the issue. So in the, in the kind of data protection cases, the separation of powers rationale seems to drop away. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the separation of power, there's no, there's no case to be made that, you know, when Equifax loses my data, my remedy should be to go complain to Congress. Although Equifax, thankfully, did get in trouble, and I, I might see a couple of bucks from that someday. So when when courts are looking at this, you know, it seems like they're 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 using this uh, separation of powers precedent, and they're applying it in uh, you know, a, a private party context where there's, you know, there's it seems like there's a good reason to believe that the that that the, the plaintiff and the defendant both have an interest uh, in defending and, and prosecuting the, the litigation. Yeah, and especially because. A very large majority of these cases are going to be class actions, especially the, the data breach cases. I mean, you, you aren't going to have a data breach really that affects two people. It's either, you know, the data stays safe or tens of millions of people are impacted. So at the very least, you're going to have class counsel and, and name plaintiffs who stand to benefit substantially from, from the case. And so they're going to be incentivized to press that case as hard as they can. And that's really all I think we should be concerned about uh, for standing purposes in, in that sort of dispute. But uh, it just it doesn't seem to come up, at least in the, in the text of the opinions, it doesn't seem like the courts are looking at it from that perspective. So, so looking at this piece, you know, if, if I had a data protection case and I was facing any kind of standing motion, this is something I'd want to be reading and citing. Do you, do you think it's going to change how courts approach this or how parties litigate these cases? 
Um, well, I certainly hope so, but the the former litigator in me doesn't doesn't hold out a lot of hope because the former litigator in me was never sure how closely the judges read the briefs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 it's hard to know. Uh, I th I certainly think so. I think my 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 major prescription here is that I I I, I hope that. If a, if a judge is looking at a standing motion in this kind of case and just takes a moment to think, you know, what is the point of the standing doctrine here? And they recognize that the point is, is this, is this case going to be presented in an appropriately adversarial fashion? If they proceed from that viewpoint, I think it's, it would be hard to deny standing in most of these cases. There are still some definite losers here. I'm not going to pretend that every one of the 217 cases was meritorious. There are some real outliers. Um, but it's certainly more than the about, I think, 54 or 55% of cases that were allowed to go forward at, at the district court level, at least. Yeah. So there, I, think, I think there's a big difference between whether they're standing and whether the case has merit. Exactly. And that's one of the, the criticisms, not just in this arena, but in, across the board, is that the court too often uses standing as a way to basically indulge its, its view of the merits before there's been any development of the merits of the case. And that just that just isn't appropriate. That's not what standing is supposed to be about. Well, uh, congratulations again on an excellent article, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, people will listen to you and we'll keep the courthouse open. <laughs> hopefully, for me, I think the some of the judges might not be so happy, which is another one of the reasons I I posit that they're throwing these cases out as docket management. But yeah, there is undoubtedly a lot of work. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>